uh, yeah, you should remind me next time. So apologies for the stream people. I forgot to start recording. So what we are discussing is the uh, faults and we're doing some simple, uh, simple calculations with faults. Yeah, really apologies for that. Okay, so the, there is uh, one more uh, question. So let's do let's do that, and then I will address the. No, there are two more. So then I will address the uh, FIFO question. All right. So the next one, next one, the the plus one was really simple. Uh, this one is a little bit more elaborate. Okay, so we're doing a fold left with the concatenation. And the initial accumulator is a string, which is xx. And then the second argument will be a list, which has numbers one to five converted to strings, right? Because we are converting the numbers into strings. And then that's the, the third argument to default. So if we do fold left, what are we going to get? What is the... Um, So I don't, there was, yeah, there is a correct answer. Uh, this is a correct answer as well. I don't know why, ah, uh, yeah. Um, so bo both are fine. The, 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 the real correct answer is actually this one uh, because it will be a string with those elements in. So, but you know, um, yeah, so, so the, this answer is not correct because it will be a string, right? So if we if we do this, so if we do a fold left with the concatenation operator, and we use um, x x as the initial uh, accumulator, and we use um, so I'm not gonna uh, so let's let's do just two elements. So if I have two elements as a string, then it's gonna con kind of uh, concatenate the elements from the left hand side using the accumulator as the um, as the first thing. And because the accumulator is the first argument, it will be x, x, 1, 2, and so on. And it will be a string, of course. Um, so that, that's good. And then one more. If we do the same, what, what will be if we do that from the right hand side? So we're doing a right fold with the same arguments, numbers one to five. Uh, yeah, I made a mistake. So there are, there are no quotes. So when you're submitting an answer, answer as a string, but with no quotes, I have to fix that. So quotes missing. So that was slide six and seven. All right. So it's the same answer, but now, you know, the argument for the concatenation is on the uh, uh, right hand side, right? So let's, let's do that. If I do that, I have, I'm concatenating from the right hand side and the accumulator is um, the second argument. I'm using the this as the first argument. So concatenate two with xx, then I have two xx and that's my accumulator. And then concatenate this with the accumulator, which is one, two xx, right? So this is the, this is the correct answer. Uh, and of course, it should have quotes around it, right? So I hope you're kind of getting the uh, getting the idea here. It it is quite simple. You just need to play with it a little bit. All right. So there was a question about um, FIFO um, um, pipes. So let's quit that for a moment. Um, so. I'm not sure how that works on Windows, to be honest. Uh, I know how it works on Linux and on, on Mac. And then you basically creating um, a, a named pipe. Because if you want to feed output from one program to the other and from the other to, to the first one, you need to create 
kind of a circular dependency. And to do circular dependency, you cannot do it with normal pipes. You have to use the named, named pipes. Um, so if you create um, if you create two pipes, first pipe <clears throat> and then the second pipe, then you have basically uh, kind of um, endpoints which you can have input and output going in, right? So you can echo something to a part to a, to a pipe in one terminal and then read from that pipe in another terminal and then you can feed kind of the the same backwards, right? So if you if you do uh, if I do this, um, so if I start listening on pipe one uh, from, uh, yeah, I have to be, so CD projects uniprog where I am in lecture three. So lecture three. So now if I, uh, Okay, cut pipe one. Then this program is waiting on anything in the, and it tries to read from pipe one, but there is nothing in pipe one. So it kind of waits, right? For, for stuff to be in, in the pipe one. And then this program, um, I'm kind of pushing something to pipe one, such that the moment I'm, I push something to pipe one, this program can read it and can print it and then um, um, yeah they both quit because the, you know after this the 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 stream to the pipe one has been closed by this program it only wrote one line uh, one word to be on to, to, to be precise and then it quit the pipe right uh, such that it closed the, the the connection such that when this one started reading it got the end of the, the stream and then it knows, okay, I got the end of the stream, so I have to quit as well. Um, if you want to combine both, so if, if I have two pipes and I'm, I'm kind of, so I'm reading on this pipe, um, but I'm pushing it to pipe two, right? So I'm cutting the outcome of pipe one into pipe two. Um, then I, you know, echo, uh, um, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, you, you need a program which can read and write to standard output. Um, so if, if I do that, like let's open one more. Um, so I have fish CD lecture three, and then I am cutting, right? So if I do cut pipe two, right? So I have now in, in direction, so I have this guy pushing into pipe one, uh, this guy reading from pipe one and pushing into pipe two, and this guy reading from pipe two. I could make this guy read from pipe two, but because echo program doesn't read from pipe two, like it doesn't read anything from a standard. I mean, you, you could in theory do this, right? So um, this program will read from pipe two and then output it to pipe one. And then this program will read from pipe one and push it back to pipe two, such that I have kind of a, like, I don't need this, this guy now. So I have, I created a cycle um, such that, you know, this one waits for something to happen on pipe two and then it will push it to pipe one. And this guy waits for something to happen on pipe one and will, will push it to pipe two. Uh, but the problem is, if I do the, if I do them, none of them starts anything, right? Because no one prints anything initially, such that they are kind of waiting for stuff to happen, right? So that's the first problem. The first problem is that this guy didn't got anything yet, so it didn't put anything in, such that this guy didn't read anything yet, so it didn't put here anything, so they just don't do anything, right? Uh, they just waiting. Um, so that's one problem. The second problem is you actually don't see what they sent to each other, right? So even though in theory you can have this um, uh, game kind of playing, it, it will basically play and quit, but you will not see what, what happens, right? So the only way to test it is to make them play and then see how they quit or if they hang. If they hang, that means something is not quite right. If they play and quit, 
that means they, you know, it worked. Uh, so in the game, if you really want to see something, you would have to have a file which you write such that you can observe what, what is happening, right? And that's why I kind of thought it was kind of a good idea, but it's a little bit tedious to do some testing because you don't see anything really on the, on the terminal. Um, but it, it should work. In theory, if you plug in the, the game from one, uh, one point to the other, then it will kind of work. And I did it for Tic Tac uh, role as well. I have uh, the Tic Tac role kind of playing with, each, with, with itself. And then, uh, you know, one of the guys wins and then the, both kind of quit. Right, but it's very non-exciting. Like you sort of start it, and they, they quit, and then it's like okay, uh, but you don't see what they played. So to to see what they play, you have to put in the program additional logic, which basically dumps what you dumping to standard output also to a file, such that you can kind of open a terminal and you can. Um, so if you have some output in a file, you can say tail dot dash f and then the file name. Uh, and then you can see on the terminal like what is happening, like what they are writing to that file, right? Um, so that's I hope that sort of answers the the named pipes question. Uh, so it is kind of an extreme case. Uh, it, the, the named pipes are usually used for chaining things, such that you you know you can. Uh, echo it to to uh, to something, and then from from something you can kind of see what is happening um, if the program is you know uh, putting something. Yeah, you can you can put it into. So Thomas is asking, can you say cut uh, pipe uh, one and put it into the background? Um, so you can, but it will still close on the closure of the of the channel. So if if cut starts reading from pipe one, and then pipe one has the end of file, the end of uh, the control D kind of sequence, it will still quit even if you do this, right? So that's one problem. And then if you do this, that cut will be in the background such that it will not be printing into the standard output because by putting it into background, you sort of lost attachment to the terminal and then it cannot put stuff into the, um, into the standard input. But of course, if you have you know, pipe two, uh, that doesn't matter be, uh, because it will be printing not to standard output, but it will be printing to pipe two, right? So in that case, that makes sense. That's true. So Sindra is asking if the pipes need to be in the same folder, uh, how do you combine it? Well, you basically put the path, right? So you just point where, where they are in your file system. So if you have two folders and two programs in two different folders, you can navigate you know, using the normal uh, you know, file um, path to point where the, where the pipes are. So you can put all the like the you know typically what you do you create your pipes in temp, and then you kind of reference them like this right. So from wh wherever you are, right, Wh wherever your programs are and wherever you are in the hierarchy doesn't matter because the pipes are in temp anyway, and then you just remove them from temp. Does it make sense? So I will remove my pipes such that I don't have kind of git issues later. <laughs> yeah. All right, so functor and applicative. Uh, very quick revision. Um, let's do some basic quizzes again. So, oh yeah, we have seven more questions to go. This one should be a winner. You just need to be fast. <laughs> that should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, 15 seconds is way too long for that one. All right. Yeah, it is five, you know, if you divide, if you do integer division between 10 and two, 10 divided by two is five, 
All right, one more. Again, super simple. Although here you need to know what is the difference between diff and what's the difference of, uh, so if I do, so um, I wait. Great, so good solid answers here, uh, one mistake. So if I do, 10 divided by two, right? And this is in the po uh, prefix notation. So of course it's five. I can write it uh, using the infix notation. So I can basically do this as well. And then the first argument is on the left-hand side and the second argument is on the right-hand side, right? And that reads better because it, it kind of reads 10 divided by two, right? So that reads a little bit better than, um, than this, but depends how you used you are to, to reading arguments to functions uh, this way. There is another operator, which is a division operator, right? Uh, so let's see. Again, it's a um, infix operator. So I have to put, that, put it in brackets. I don't need to put this in brackets because this is not an infix operator. I only need to put in brackets infix operators, right? So this, 10 divided by two is a floating point division. It's not an integer division. And then it results in a floating point number and it treats those polymorphic constants, uh, those polymorphic literals as um, floating point numbers, right? And then the outcome is this, right? So then there is a bit of a difference if I, okay, so, all right, one more. So here I'm doing the integer division, right? It is simple, but if you're not used to looking at those things, it takes a bit of time, right? If you did like perfect, perfect answers here, uh, we basically flipping the, the arguments, right? So it's the same as just the question before, but we flipped it, right? So if I do this, if I do um, this, I have five. If I do this, I have, I don't have zero. Uh, I will have zero if I do integer division, but if I do floating point division, of course it's 0 0.2, right? So then if I do flip, it's kind of the same, right? Um, all right, so that's, um, that's that. So having this under our belt, let's try something a little bit more functory and applicative based. So we have four more questions. We're not doing bad. So I'm doing fmap x and y. So x is a functor, y is a functor, or both are functors? So uh, a little bit disappointing <laughs> that um, majority got it wrong. Uh, remember when we talked when we talked about functors? So tell me about functor. Okay, so um, a functor has something that has an F map, and then the first argument to F map is what? What is this? Well, this is just a normal function. It's a normal function value to value, right? So when we set f map plus, well, let's say plus two to just 10, right? Um, which of them is a functor? Well, just 10 is a functor because plus two is just a normal function, right? So if I do that, I need the 
brackets. Then I end up with just 12 and you know, this is not a functor. This is a functor, right? So let's hide this. All right, so the answer is y is a functor. Okay, so one more. Don't don't rush. You know, take take your time. It's better to answer right than to rush. So why this magic infix operator and x? Which one is the functor? So at least you should know that, like, if we're talking about functors and we're doing something with, with functors then one of them is not a functor because one of them is just a normal function, right? So which one of those is a normal function? Um, well, let's check it out. So if I say, okay, tell me what is this infix operator uh, magic dollar thingy, right? Tell me about this. And it says, well, look, um, this operator takes a normal function, takes a functor and gives me back a functor, right? So if I ask, okay, so what fmap is, it is basically the same thing, right? So this is fmap in infix operator, right? So if I have x, um, this, y, it's exactly the same as fmap x, y, which is exactly the same as x infix of fmap, oops, to y, right? All of those are this, exactly the same. It's the just syntax, but the, the meaning, the semantics of this is exactly the same, right? So if I have y f map to x, then I have this being a function and this being a functor, right? Because again, if we call back this and I call it without f map, I call it um, like this, it just gives me just 12, right? So remember, with functors, one of them is not a functor. One of them is just a normal function, value to value. The other one is a functor and the result is a functor, right? Okay, so uh, one more, I hide this. Now you should get it right. So which one is a functor? Not both, don't tell me both are functors. Only one is a functor, which one? Yeah, a little bit of mind bending. Well, so normally, fmap takes a function and the functor and applies the function to a functor, right? But if we flip, that means we flip the two elements, right? So we, we rotated the, the arguments. So if I uh, show you here, right? So we have, um, let's call it x just 10 right? And y is our plus 10 function or plus two function. Okay. So now uh, if I do f map, <clears throat> if I try to do x to y, uh, Haskell will complain. Like it says, you cannot apply, uh, you know, a functor to a function because f map, f -map expects a function uh, as a first argument, right? So I have to call y a function on x. So it gives me just 12, right? But what if I flip, what if I flip the, the arguments? And then because I'm flipping the arguments, I have to, I can only flip arguments of a function, right? So I have to kind of use the syntax to, to say that the second argument, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so it actually worked the first time around. So if I try to call that, it says, 
Well, you know, you again, it, it, it's like calling, it's like calling this, um, it's like calling this. So this comp th this doesn't work. So X, uh, maybe it's it's simpler if I don't, you know, if I use the functions because then you have to keep track of what X was, right? So just then. So if I try to do that, it doesn't work because the first argument needs to be a function, right? But if I do this, um, that works. Okay, so that works. And if I do this, it doesn't work again. But if I do this, it works, right? So if I flip the arguments to, to fmap, then the second one is a function, right? So here, if I, I don't need this symbol, to be honest, like, um, because I can have it. So I, I can have it, but I don't need it because the, the, um, the function application kind of works without this symbol anyway. So if I kind of flip it, then it means y is a function and x is a functor uh, because x is the second one, right? All right, so we've been using uh, as an examples just or maybe maybe something, maybe ints or maybe numbers uh, as a functor, but you can also use that as applicatives because they are applicatives too, right? So let's kind of start with applicatives. Start quiz. So x splat y, which one is the applicative? Well, remember, remember that why we had applicatives in the first place. Um, so. If we have a normal function like uh, like this, right? I can operate on a value with some context. So I can operate on a value within a context of a functor, uh, but this is just a plain normal function. So the the you know remember functor plain normal functions and values which are kind of with the context, right? And that worked and that was fine. But if we put the value in the context, if we said value is in the context uh, and the function is in the context, then it doesn't work. We can't, we can't do that and we cannot combine them. Like what can we put here to operate through the function with within some particular context on the value on the context. We, we couldn't do it with functors and we couldn't do it with monoids and we couldn't do it with the semi-groups. So we had to have something extra and this extra was the applicative, right? So the extra thing was the applicative and that allowed us to apply a function to a value where both were in context, right? So now we can do that. And this is an applicative, and this is an applicative, right? So this is the correct answer. Um, all right, one more. That one should be easy now. You you know the answer. I just gave you the answer. Just you know, just here. So I have now A, B, and C. Which ones of those are applicatives? Mm, oh, look, 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 look here. Applicative, splat, applicative, what do we got back? We got back an applicative, right? So we have function inside an applicative, argument to that function inside an applicative, 
the value gonna get computed and the value is gonna be given to us back as an applicative, right? So all three, all three applicatives. Um, so if I combine two applicatives, then the outcome is an applicative. Which one of those are functions? Well, it kind of depends. I mean, definitely A is a function. Uh, in functor, the first argument was always a function. The second argument was always a value. And the outcome was always a value. Uh, the value could be a function, right? I, uh, in, in Haskell, I have partial application, right? So I could have, so, you know, talk about talking about functors. Um, I can apply fmap plus to just 10. What I'm gonna get? Uh, will I get a value inside an um, um, functor? No, because I supplied just one argument to this function, right? So I'm gonna get a partial application of a function. I'm gonna get, um, so it doesn't know how to show it, but it works. So if I say my f, so let's say my f now is something that works, but I cannot show it, but what it is. So what is f? f is just plus 10. Okay, if I say is f this, um, uh, let's see. Uh, no, it can't, I can't really do that. But believe me, like uh, F is a functor inside um, inside just, like it's, it's a function inside just, right? So if I apply it, so if I splat it with another just two, then I'm gonna get just 12, right? So this, this first thing which I've done here, I applied a function like I, I use a functor, like this is a functor and I use a functor to get an out outcome, which is a function inside my, inside my functor, right? Um, but I cannot do anything with it. I, I need a, an applicative to be able to, to do something with it, right? I could, um, um, I could, like because it is plus 10 function, I can kind of get it out if I'm inside the do notation or if I'm inside like a, um, a particular structure where I can access the inside thing, then I can apply it to, to a value. So like coming back to, to the question, which one of those are functions and which one of those are values? Uh, well, you know, this has to be a function and this can be a value, but C can be a function. Like the outcome of this combination can be either a value or a value which is a, a function or you know partially applied function. So if the, the same as with the if I combine, so if I combine just plus with just ten using a splat, then I'm gonna end up not with just value. I'm gonna end up with just function, right? And then if I combine this just function with uh, we have a plus, so let's combine it with just two. Um, I'm gonna get just 12, right? You, you sort of understand that they are all applicatives. They have to be applicatives. A has to be applicative, B has to be applicative, and C has to be applicative. But applicative of, of what? And this what can be a function or it can be a value. I mean, in Haskell, every place where you can have a value, you can have a function effectively. All right, so uh, there is a question from Marcus uh, and the question is for the flipping. So let me, so uh, I think the question was about this. Um, yeah, so let's go back. All right, so we have, question yeah this one right so um yeah so if we if we substitute x with um just 10 and the y with plus 2 then we have a situation where i'm doing um flip 
f map and then i have y which is just 10 and then plus 2 um, so what I, as i said i don't need this uh, dollar symbol it, it it is basically the same it just means um the the flip so so if i have the dollar sign what happens is flip flips the arguments for this but because it's missing the final element it creates a partially applied function which expects one element to to finish right so after this i have a imagine i have a function which wants one element and this one element will be the first element of the f map which will then do the f map because i flipped the the arguments so this argument is the first argument to f map but it because of flip it gets put into the second position the first position for f map is not filled in yet and this creates me a function which waits for this first element and then i i get this this first element here right if i don't do the the dollar sign um flips basically takes this function takes this element puts it as a first argument takes this as a second and creates an, a new function which calls f map with those arguments swapped right i don't have a partial application uh, of the function yeah all right so that that's how the flip sort of works um so flip is a little bit counterintuitive i i always have i need to like stutter a little bit on flip because it's like oh yeah what goes where like what happens and it's the same with const uh so const also is a function which makes me a little bit stutter uh const is a very simple function and flip is also a very simple function so what const do if you pass const two arguments it just gives you the second argument back right so const uh, no no it, it gives you the first argument and ignores the second right let's try let's check um so it uh takes two arguments and gives you the first argument back right so if if you call it const uh two and ten it gives you two it doesn't matter what what you put here right uh and doesn't matter what type that is neither right um uh, because the second argument is basically ignored so you can have anything as a second argument and it always returns you the first argument right um so for example uh imagine that i have um imagine that i have uh, a da data type which is um three and it says i have one two and three okay so that's that's my data type and it has two unit unit um uh values right so i can have a equals one or b equals two and then if i ask what's the type of a it says well it's the you know it's um the type is three but the the values are one two three right so i can have one of those values being at um, the the actual value of my of my variables right so if i have a function so if, let, let's say i will do um i will do a function which uh uh generates an empty uh tic-tac-toe board and the tic-tac-toe board is three by three so i kind of i have a kind of a type three um so if i want to initialize it such that it generates me um a, a partial partially applied function which takes uh three and three and gives me um maybe maybe bull okay so i have oops i need to do this so i have a function which takes um two arguments the first being one of the three the second one of the three and then it gives me a maybe bull if there is anything in that location right um so uh, let's say um nothing is the the location is empty true is a circle or x 
and no no like false is the opposite right so i can represent a tic tac toe board using this kind of a, a functional mapping right of my domain and then my implementation of the empty would be const const nothing right and then i will close it uh may yeah i screwed up the so we have to do that again i screwed up the maybe maybe bull right so then i do this and i close it and then um if i call empty what happens what happens if i call this function uh what are those two functions doing right um so it works like i i uh, like to, to uh, you know uh if i want an empty tic-tac-toe board i can say uh board and i can call empty and it works like i have an empty board i i just cannot show it because i have those uh partially applied functions and i have this kind of a functional mapping with two arguments such that you know it's not representable easily as a as a string there is no show for it but it works so my board now is an empty board and it effectively has so um if i call it like if i call it with one one what is gonna return it's gonna return nothing right because the, the board is empty so if i call it with two with one two like one two or let's call it two two like the middle element right uh it will give me nothing right but this kind of boggles boggles my head a little bit so anyway let's move on um so another question uh no we did all, all the questions leaderboard all right leaderboard first all right so we had ribbit today was the fastest and the most accurate congratulations sebastian and thomas and uh, the other people are kind of close close by and we have quite a strong um leader leaderboard today pretty good all right so monats let's have a look uh at the kind of um short summary it's a data structure that captures specific computation uh so we've been going from semi groups to uh, like from semi groups to monoids to functors to applicatives uh and you remember that um the monoid was the the simplest one it was just a binary operation with an identity and then we had a functor which allowed us to map a function onto something that had a context right so like um i have uh this you know plus two function uh and normally i apply it to a number and it works right but now i have an ability to apply it to a maybe number right so if i apply it to if i apply it to um just then it works but i can also apply it to nothing and it works right it works it just produces nothing so i have ability to apply a normal function which is like plus two uh, which takes just a normal value normal element and it can understand like uh we can express the sort of the the behavior of what happens if i apply it to a functor right um and it, it is the same like if i have uh another functor is either either something so if i have uh, a right value and the value is yeah 10 whatever then it, it's gonna work it's gonna give me an either value but then if i had either used for some sort sort of error i have let's say um i o error so the left is a string uh then it kind of continues to work it, it gives me back this error such that i can kind of chain things i can chain operations of normal functions and then i can keep track 
of the errors or of some sort of state of what the computation was in. And then with the applicatives, it allowed us to do, to do the same for both. I can have a function in a context or partially applied function in a context and the value applied in a context and I can combine them together, right? Um, so one, um, so the, the most powerful thing that we had so far was uh, if I go into applicative, uh, was this transformation, which was you take a function in some context and a value in a context and you get a value in a context, right? So A and B are values. A and B can be of different types. But like here, th those are types of values, right? Uh, I, I have uh, the function which takes some type of values in the domain A and some and maps them to B, right? Uh, but those are kind of a, a value types. Those are not complex types. So now we're missing one, one more element. And th that element is that uh, so far, all our functions, which we had ability to do something with, were normal fu functions. Like they were like plus or plus uh, two or whatever. That they were functions that took normal value elements, right? We didn't have. It, neither in functor ne uh, nor in applicative ability to transform a normal value to something that was not a normal value. We can change types. We can cha change int to float or int to string, but we cannot change int to an applicative, right? Um, in, in, in a sense, you can do that, but it's a, uh, it's a bit awkward, right? Uh, because the, you know we we don't recognize that b is you know applicative itself um, so what if i have an ability to use a function which allows me to take the state and manipulate it like i have a state and a value and then i kind of doing something to it but i carry over that state right um, so that's what uh monads are. The monads are kind of the next step and it's an abstraction that allows structuring your programs kind of generically. It's kind of like template programming in C++, like generic programming, where everywhere, everything you do, it, it doesn't have this kind of a type specified. The type gets filled in kind of later. And then monads allow you to kind of abstract some boilerplate out of your code and capture some computation as an abstraction and some effects. It, it is, I mean, once, once you sort of understand it, it kind of makes sense, but they say like, once you understand it, you lose the ability to explain it. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, if, if you check the uh, Wikipedia page, um, they basically say it, it is, yeah, th this is what, what we said uh, and then they have some ability to remove the boilerplate and they kind of, um, you have the ability to represent a specific computation, okay? Uh, so you, you're having a value, but you also have this sort of notion of what this computation is and you operate on it in a kind of a, a um, um, combined way. Uh, so if we go back to this, um, you, 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 like it's good to understand the monadic laws, but you don't really have to. It's it it, it uh, for using it. It's kind of enough if you understand that you're carrying over a certain uh, certain state with the value, right? So let me see. Um, there was IO monad. So IO monad is kind of the the. Um, uh, used to represent sort of the, the real world actions inside Haskell. And it, it works like this. You have a function and this function has this kind of a monad as a return type. And it appears if, if nothing is being kind of uh, taken in, but each operation which does something with the, with the monad changes the state of the monad itself. And then this, this function in itself is um, kind of do, doing some operations on the value, 
but the value in this case is nothing. Like we don't care about what the value is. What we care is about the state which is captured inside the monad itself. Um, and we have a do notation for manipulating that state uh, by you know, uh, sequencing the pro pro uh, program as if it was kind of imperative. Uh, or we can unfold the whole thing into uh, this operator and this operator. Um, this operator is very simple. Uh, so if you ask, OK, what is, what is this? It basically takes one value, another value, and returns you the second value, right? So it is kind of like const, but it doesn't care about the first element. It sort of cares about the second one, right? So if I say, if I, if I, say I have just 10, and I sequence with just 20, I'm gonna get just 20. Like the first one is kind of, you know, is there. It may have some side effects. If that was a function, it could have some side effects uh, which were captured inside the monad. But then the outcome is always the, the second value, right? So this operator is, is quite, quite simple. It's for sequencing kind of effects or sequencing actions. Uh, and then this operator is a little bit more com complex and that's the operator which we are looking for, right? So if I ask, okay, give me the definition of this operator, uh, we see that we take, um, yeah, so, so let, let's do, uh, let's, the, the flip of it, okay, first. So let's, let's do that first. So this one takes a function um, and a, a value with a context and gives me a new value with the context, right? And the function which it takes is very similar to what we had with mmap, right? So if I ask, okay, uh, remind me what fmap was. And in fmap, we see that it takes a function, but the function is from A to B. Uh, and then I have kind of an A value in a context and the B outcome uh, in a context. Here, we have this ability to inject the effects or kind of a context inside the, the function. We, we do that because we define this function, right? We supply this function to this uh, monadic operator. And then we give the value in the mona monadic context and get another value in, a, in the monadic context. But th this time we get the, the type changed, right? So we have an ability to convert a plain value into something that has this kind of effectful context. And like th this is the operator which takes the function first and the value second. Uh, but normally we use the like th this definition, which has those two flipped. So we, we say we bind, this is a bind operator. We bind this value to this function, right? Such that this, this function can access the element out of this M context and then produce us a new value in the, um, in the same context, right? So M is kind of common. Uh, the type I can have M of, of some type like M of int or M of string and I can convert it. I can change the, the value type. I can change from you know, int to string but the M kind of stays the same. The, the context of the computing of what I'm doing is kind of constant. Um, so this is a little bit complex. I, I cannot explain it like in 10 minutes, like uh, you need to read the chapter in the book and you need to spend some time on it and different people take more or, or less time with it to, to kind of click uh, what this is. Um, to use it, it's very straightforward. Uh, so again, uh, maybe um, uh, is a, an example of a monad. And now what we can do is pretty much with maybe it's kind of the same as with the applicative that we can have a just 10 being bound to a, a function which is kind of in the monadic context, right? So um, it's kind of the same as with the um, Let's see. So I have a, a monadic value and I, I bind it to, um, oh, come on. Um, 
So I have, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, I need a, uh, I need a function. So I, I was doing it wrong. So I need a function which takes, um, which takes x, which is the value, and gives me a new. Um, so I, I need some sort of lambda. Um, remember the, um, yeah. So my function needs to take a, which is the value, and give give me a kind of a new new context here. So I have to supply this function, right? So that that's the power which we gained by uh, by having the. Um, uh, uh, the, the monadic context. So here I can create a function which needs to uh, provide this uh, monadic context. The monadic context we are in is maybe. So I have ability to ch to change what x is. I can I can uh, you know I can use maybe string or I can do um, like I have more power here. So I can say if x is bigger than ten. Uh, then return just x, else um, return nothing, right? So I could do that. Uh, and then I kind of, like I have this function. So let's, let's use this function. So I, I define this function as f. And then I have this value just 10 and I'm bounding it I kind of bind it with the with f, and I can kind of do the same using the reverse. So I can say like this, and then because it will return me only just value if it's more than ten, then it returns just eleven. But if I give something lower, then it returns nothing. And I can do different effects here. Uh, I can. Um, I don't need to return, um, you know, ints. I can convert them to strings, and I can return a string, right? So what I could do is I could define my f saying um, just show x, right? Else, I can return uh, just too small, right? So I can do that. So if I say bind it now with nine. It says, well, the number is too small. If I bind it with 11, it just gives me 11 as a string, right? So I converted it to a string, and now I have uh, just values to check if the element is um, correct or not. What happens if I put it nothing, right? Well, nothing will be returned. So it will work for this kind of uh, case as well. Um, all right, so I went a little bit over time. Um, the rest of the slides are uh, about the, uh, the the monadic operators. So that, that's like what I already told you. Uh, so this I already told you. And then there is the same element as pure in the in the as, um, applicative. Uh, in monad, it's called return, and it takes just a value and returns the initial context, right? So every time in your program, when, when you say return, you know, something, you're basically wrapping a plain value into a monadic context. Um, and then we have um, one more, which is the sequencing operator, which is basically defined as, a, as, as this one with this as an identity operation. Uh, so that works the same way. And then the, the, the difference is that um, in applicatives, you cannot manipulate the context. You can only manipulate the values. But in, in monads, you have the ability to manipulate the context as well. Uh, and this is quite, uh, quite powerful. So what we're going to do next, uh, next week, we, we will use these concepts and deal with slightly more complicated programming tasks. And we kind of uh, get a feel of what and and of how it works and and what we can do with it. And I will also explain a little bit of why Haskell functions are still pure even though they have some kind of side effects, right? All right. So that's all. Uh, sorry for going over time and sorry for not recording the beginning of the of the class. So thanks.